Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's event. My name is Dr. Miran Liu, and I'm currently an honorary associate uh, at the discipline of government and international relations, at the University of Sydney. I will be serving as your moderator for today's event. Today's event is CDS China Development Society 2020 China Talk, the complexity of China series. Today's theme is China and global governance. Is global leadership changing hand delivered by Professor Mark Beeson, which who I will be um, uh, introducing in detail later. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the country. Uh, I, uh, we acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional uh, owners of the land which we live, meet, learn, and work, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestry lands, never ceded, that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our knowledge, teaching, and the research practices within the university, uh, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I'd all, like also to pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that knowledge to all the Aboriginal persons attending today's event. Before we get started, I'd like also to, uh, to take a few minutes of your time to introduce uh, and thank the organizer of today's event, China Development Society. It is a full-profile society organized independently by students at UCIT. As a student organization, it serves students, especially international students. They hope to inspire peers to integrate into campus life through activities, reflect deeply, and give back to society. Their committee consists more than 100 UC students with 400 ordinary members actively attending their events. They have four types of events. The first type is the academic events. China talks like this one is one of them, as well as annual China development forum to discuss academic topics related to China's development, broadly speaking. The second one is China's Chinese cultural events. They had three performances of the Secret Love for the Peach Blossom Spring, which was the first student-led Chinese drama at the University of Sydney. Thirdly, they have voluntary teaching program. At the end of each year, they have voluntary teaching program, the World Hope Project, all year one. A total of 100 volunteers from UCIT are sent to rural areas uh, in China to support the education there. Last but not least, the mentorship program, every semester they host events to share experience to the new students. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, welcome the president of the China Development Society, Yi Yang Xu. He would like to express his gratitude to the speaker and the audience. Thank you. Here you go, Yi Yang. Thank you, Miran. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event. I want to start by thanking each and every one of you for coming. Your presence here tonight means a lot to us, and we're truly grateful to have you here. I also want to take a moment to thank Professor Beeson and Dr. Liu, who have graciously agreed to share the insights and experiences with us tonight. We're honored to have you here, and we look forward to learning from you. And lastly, I want to thank the CDS team for organizing this event, especially Teddy and Nate and the whole of China Talk team for putting together an event like this can take a lot of hard work and dedication. And we're grateful for all of your efforts. So thank you for making this event possible. So um, without further ado, I will now hand over back to you, Miran. Thank you, Yi Yang. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce a little bit about this public lecture series, The Complexity of China. By hosting this public lecture series in 2022, the CDS aims to portray the complexity of China from different perspectives and bringing uh, reasoned arguments that provide facts and evidence 
uh, underpaying more nuanced assignment of China. In the opening lecture of this series, complex China, complex China, change casuals community. They have invited, they had invited the director of China Study Center, as you said, Professor David Goodman, as the first guest speaker. After that, there was another very important, uh, fascinating event called Women in China. Uh, I'd also like to talk about why we chose China and global governance as today's theme. Firstly, because China, because of China's increasing influence and capacity to engage to actively in global governance, not only in, the, in terms of those international institutions such as the United Nations, but also those global and regional uh, in, initiatives such as the well, One Belt, One Road. Uh, many scholars, therefore, and as well as um, general publics, are worried about China's self-positioning or its identity. China is increasingly more confident in defining itself uh, as a full flag great power. May uh, this fact may inevitably change the international status quo or the uh, West-led or the U.S.-led liberal international order. Um, Therefore, we are curious about China's level of involvement, future goal and potential, and any other voices expressing comments on China's role in its participation in global governance. Uh, now, moving along to our session, uh, please welcome Professor Mark Beeson, who will be speaking to us on the topic of China and global, uh, gl uh, global governance. We are fortunate to have Professor Mark Beeson. He's one of the leading scholars on this topic. You'll be hearing a presentation from Professor Mark Beeson on this very important subject. Professor Mark Beeson is an adjunct professor at the Australia-China Relations Institute, Accred, University of Technology, Sydney. Before that, he taught at the University of Western Australia. He was the professor. He was a professor there, and Murdoch University, Griffith University, the University of Queensland, York University in the UK, and Birmingham University in the UK, where he was the head of department. He was also a visiting professor at Institute for Public Policy, South China University of Technology in Guangzhou and the China Foreign Affairs University in Beijing. Mark's work is centered on the politics, economics, and security of the broadly conceived Asian Pacific region. He is the author of more than 200 journal articles and book chapters, and the founding editor of Critical Studies of the Asian Pacific. I think this is a very moderate introduction of Professor Beeson because he is certainly one of the most qualified speakers to talk on this topic. I personally, in my PhD thesis, I had cited like more than 12, I think 13 actually, works written by <laughs> Professor Mark Beeson, uh, or co-authored by Professor Mark Beeson, or written uh, solely by Professor Mark Beeson. Also this morning, I found this book, Regionalism and Globalization in East Asia, Politics, Security, and Economic Development, written by Professor Mark Easton, uh, the second edition. I think I've already read the book at least three times. Uh, this is certainly one of the classics on this very topic. Uh, so therefore, we, we are having, we, we have a true, uh, like, we have a true expert on the topic today. I think this is certainly one of the um, required readings uh, for a lot of subjects uh, in terms of uh, regionalism, uh, global governance, and the East Asian politics. And um, this is me. And before we hand, I hand over to Professor Mark Beeson, I, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to, uh, to introduce a little bit about today's content. Today, uh, today's content will be hearing today, we'll be hearing insights on questions such as the rise of China and the global redistribution of power, which is very important. As we all know, the rise of China is certainly one of the most important uh, variables of today's global governance or international politics, or as well as geopolitics versus geoeconomics. Uh, I think one of the 
uh, overarching arguments of this book was that you cannot understanding you cannot understand economics by uh, without an adequate understanding of security and uh, uh, and economics and geopolitics. So, in other words, geopolitics and geoeconomics they are constitutive. Therefore, would like to hear some insights from Professor Mark, Mark Beeson himself on this uh, particular particular question. Also, we'll be hearing some discussions on the question such as, is there a Chinese paradigm? In other words, is there an alternative? Things like Beijing consensus, is that a thing? Is that a real thing? Is that a concrete thing? Such uh, can be comparable to things like Washington consensus, for example. What should we expect from China-led global initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative? A lot of people believe Belt and Road Initi Initiative has reached its peak whether that's the case, uh, we will see. And also a very important question, does global governance need to be necessarily be democratic? This is another very important uh, thing to discuss because a lot of people think being democratic is the foundation of so-called global governance. Uh, but some countries, some people disagree. So we will be talking about this question as well. And finally, Professor Mark Beeson will bring us back to the central question. Can China lead? Can China be the leader of, of the global order of global governance or one of the leaders of, of that order? And remember, there is a Q&A session after around one hour. After a, uh, one, around one hour, uh, there will be a Q&A session. Please prepare your questions during uh, the lecture, and please keep the questions as precise, as straightforward, as direct as possible. And so we can have more people having the opportunity to ask questions uh, to Professor Mark Beeson. Okay, without further ado, I will now hand over to Professor Mark Beeson. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Minran. That was a very generous introduction. And I'm glad to hear there's at least one person in the world that's been reading my work. So that's very encouraging. So uh, now I've got a little PowerPoint and I'll try to firstly share my screen and then share the PowerPoint if I can manage to do all of the above. Here we go. Okay, is that working? All good? Yeah, yes. Okay. So this is, oh, this is the uh, title of my presentation. So I want to talk about China and global governance and uh, think about whether uh, it may be actually uh, international leadership may actually be changing hands. And that for a lot of people is a simply unimaginable possibility, but uh, as we'll see, it may not be as unlikely as some people think. So let me see if I can get this thing to work. Uh, here we go. So I've got a few, uh, what I've described as key issues and questions here uh, that you might want to think about as we go along. The big point to make, I think, about uh, China is that it's uh, re-emerged as a, a great power in an extraordinarily short period of time. It's quite unbelievable in many ways. And this is in itself unprecedented, as is the fact that it's, it's an Asian power that is at the center of global affairs now, not just uh, East Asia. The interesting question to think about, I think, is this is going to be a major challenge for everybody in the West, broadly speaking, particularly the United States and, and close allies like Australia, because they've been used to running the show for the last 50, 60, 100 years or so, maybe, you know, for the last couple of hundred years, depending on how you want to think about these things. But, but for a long time, the world has been dominated by the West, and for a lot of co commentators and policymakers in the West, the rise of China is an enormous challenge, uh, not just in material terms, but psychologically uh, as well, I think. The big question is, uh, if we accept that China is a rising power, which it undoubtedly is, uh, what will leadership with Chinese characteristics actually look like? Will it be very different from what we've been used to under the auspices of American leadership for the last 60 or 70 years, uh, or will it look uh, rather different. And in this context, uh, one of China's most important initiatives, I think, has been the so-called Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which may or may not prove to be a new form of influence, hegemony in the world, uh, and, a, and a way of asserting Chinese leadership, 
And it could be a, a really good thing because some people have talked about the possibility of a green Belt and Road Initiative, which could prioritize uh, much needed uh, sustainable uh, development initiatives as part of this big rollout of this major project. So it's, you know, I think, and I'll talk about this later on, I think that climate change is the biggest challenge that everybody on the planet currently faces, whether they're Chinese, American, Australian, or whatever. That's the key challenge. Uh, and perhaps China offers one way, potentially, of doing something about it. It's not certainty. Plenty could go wrong. It's difficult to know how serious it all is, but it's a possibility. And that could be the most important form of leadership uh, there could possibly be. So that that's the kind of issues I want to talk about, and I'll run through them as we go. Oh, let me just get this thing going. Okay, so let me just make a few observations about leadership and global governance uh, generally. The big point to make, I think, is that over the last 100, maybe 150 years or so, uh, the transnationalization of economic activity in particular has forced policymakers to think about the way that they interact, uh, the kinds of uh, economic and indeed political relationships that they have as a consequence of what is often described as quote unquote globalization. So to make globalization work and to facilitate greater economic cooperation and interaction, you need a kind of structure, you need a set of institutions to help that work uh, effectively. So that's been one of the kind of key features of the international system over the last uh, 50, 100 years, and China has been one of the principal beneficiaries of this. However, having said that, uh, there are limits to global governance, uh, and I think they're becoming clearer at the moment with the war in Ukraine, with the tensions between China and America, uh, particularly in the security arena, it's been very difficult to get effective agreement uh, on how countries should behave uh, beyond the sort of regional focus. So some parts of the world, arguably uh, in the European Union, they have had significant degrees of cooperation, uh, importantly facilitated to a great extent by the United States in the aftermath of the Second World War. But whatever you think about institutions like NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it has been an effective security uh, regime for the countries that are involved in it. And crucially, in my view, it allowed the European Union to really uh, accelerate that process of economic integration that's been such a feature of Europe's reconstruction after the Second World War and it's and Europe's amazing rise to prosperity uh, as well. So clearly at the regional level at least, it is possible for countries to cooperate in a significant way that generates real benefits for the participants. The big question is, can that be expanded beyond these kind of regional areas into something greater that includes countries that are very, very different because the Europeans had quite a lot in common, not, not the least of which was their kind of history. So the question is, uh, given that individual states still dominate the international system and still uh, look to uh, pursue their own individual national interests, is it actually possible for real effective global governance to uh, occur anywhere? And it's not just uh, China that's pretty focused on improving its national position. The United States has spent the last 60 or 70 years uh, entrenching its hegemony and its national interests uh, and giving expression to them in the international system. I think the interesting and important difference between the United States and China in this regard is that the United States has some very enthusiastic supporters and allies. And the country we're all in at the moment, Australia, is perhaps the quintessential example of just how enthusiastic support for the United States can actually be. There is nothing uh, that Australia will not do to assist the United States, it seems, even fighting in far off wars uh, in support of the United States uh, in ways that have no real relevance to Australia, 
but Australian policymakers feel duty bound to do it. China can't really point to any other country that has the same kind of relationship with it. Sure, it's got a couple of allies like North Korea, maybe Russia, but with friends like that, as they say, who needs enemies? These are not great allies to have at the moment. So that's a bit of a problem uh, for China. However, whatever we think about uh, China's limited array of followers and friends at the moment, there is no doubt, and I'll talk about this more later on, there is no doubt that China's sheer material uh, economic presence in the international system is giving it increased influence and uh, many of its neighbors, particularly in Southeast Asia, are conscious of this and conscious of the need to have a good working relationship with China because China is simply uh, such an important economic actor uh, in the region. So that's a big deal too. This is a, an interesting chart. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I don't, don't know if this is in the way, but, uh, but, but this is an interesting chart because it gives you a bit of a sense of, uh, can I get rid of this? Yep. It gives you a sense of uh, what uh, the last couple of hundred, 2000 years of economic development has looked like. And the big point to make here is that China used to be uh, one of the most important uh, economic centers of activity in the world. And it's uh, famously just the 100 years of shame in which they suffer from uh, European imperialism uh, and domestic crises, that China wasn't a major uh, source of economic activity in the world. So in many ways, this chart demonstrates that what we're seeing is uh, we're going back to kind of business as usual, if you like, where China uh, has become once again uh, one of, if one of, if not the biggest uh, center of economic activity in the world. And this is pretty much the way it's been uh, in most of recorded history. So it's not that unusual, but it is unusual in the context of most people who are alive today and who can only remember the United States occupying that kind of position. And so it's a real challenge for countries like the United States and countries like Australia. Uh, as well, of course. This is a similar kind of chart that shows just how rapidly things are changing in the world. And it's worth remembering that when countries were hegemonic, Britain used to be the hegemonic power of the 19th century because it had the largest economy and it was able to influence international affairs as a consequence. During the 20th century, the United States had the largest economy in the world. And it's no coincidence that that gave it the leverage, the influence to be able to shape the international system as a consequence. So it's not too fanciful uh, to suggest that if China continues on this remarkable uh, growth uh, and increasing economic importance, that it will also have the opportunity to shape the international system simply because of its economic importance. Now, there's quite a lot that could go wrong with this, uh, and not the least of which is climate change, of course, but all other things being equal, we would expect that China's influence would grow over time, and this would provide the material uh, preconditions, if you like, for growing Chinese influence in the world. Let me say something about uh, what uh, Min Ram was talking about in his introduction about geopolitics and geoeconomics. We've been used to thinking about uh, power in the international system in terms of geopolitics. That's the traditional uh, concerns about interstate security, often determined by military power and capability, and clearly China's got a lot of that. But it's also significant that China's got increasing geoeconomic power. And you can see from this little chart uh, how many companies China now has uh, in, the, in the largest uh, economic sectors uh, in the world. And this has happened remarkably quickly, uh, and it's potentially remarkably important and significant in the long term that this is the kind of reality of Chinese uh, economic development. And geoeconomics uh, has been defined as applying e economic instruments to advance geopolitical ends. In other words, there are other ways short of traditional warfare, 
and conflict of countries exercising influence. They can do it through their economic leverage uh, and their economic might. The Americans did this in Europe and elsewhere around the world, uh, and China is doing as well. Not exactly in the same way, but, but there are striking similarities in, say, the Marshall Plan in Western Europe that helped to underpin the European Union's rise and the Belt and Road Initiative that China's currently rolling out in places like Central and Southeast Asia. What's interesting about China, I think, is that it isn't uh, the kind of free market laissez-faire model that the Americans championed. They didn't always do it at home, of course, but they certainly championed it abroad. Uh, what's distinctive about China is that uh, the state takes a very uh, close interest and has close control over many of the most important economic actors in inside China. And this can uh, make uh, using economic power and leverage that much easier uh, because it has direct influence over what uh, Chinese-based companies can and cannot do. And that's a big difference, I think, between uh, what the Americans were able to do and what China might be able to do uh, in the future. This is what geoeconomics looks like in practice. And this is a little map of China and Southeast uh, Asia and some of its major trading partners. And you can see uh, just how important trade with uh, China is for all of the Southeast Asian countries. I think without exception, uh, China is everybody's number one trading partner. So the reality is that these smaller Southeast Asian economies simply cannot afford to upset uh, China gratuitously, have a bad relationship with China, because it's simply too important to uh, upset or alienate. So China's everybody's uh, major trading partner. Everybody has to have uh, good relationships with the People's Republic, even if they're nervous about some of China's uh, security policies uh, and activities in, in the region. Uh, and one of the striking things about this, I think, is that uh, economic interdependence, that's greater economic activity between separate uh, economies in the, in the world, uh, that was uh, seen as a good thing and crucial to peaceful development. And I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that argument is actually uh, pretty accurate most of the time. And I think, again, the European Union demonstrates just how important and effective economic interdependence can be in transforming relations between countries like Germany and France, uh, Germany and Britain for a while at least. Uh, there are clearly limits to this, uh, but economic interdependence does promote peace and cooperation in, uh, as a general rule of thumb. However, what we're seeing at the moment uh, is that uh, the Americans, uh, Australians, are increasingly nervous about uh, Chinese investment, the influence of particular Chinese technology companies, uh, and there have been uh, efforts to so-called decouple China and the United States in particular, because many people in the United States are worried that they're becoming too dependent on China for particular forms of technology, or they want to restrict the transfer of advanced forms of technology uh, to China. So in some ways, those assumptions about the uh, benefits of economic dependence are being tested by the current relationship between the United States and China, and the uh, suspicion on both sides, I think, uh, that there may be dangers as well as advantages in becoming too closely enmeshed with uh, a trading partner who may also be a geopolitical uh, competitor. And it's worth pointing out that this wasn't the case during the so-called Cold War when uh, the United States and the Soviet Union hardly had any economic inter integration at all. So this is a very different state of affairs, but it's not clear that the, the sort of pacifying effect of economic interdependence is going to transform uh, relations between uh, key economies like the United States and China uh, in a 
in a peaceful and useful way. So that, that's one of the kind of big unanswered questions uh, at the moment, I think. So uh, Minra mentioned, I was gonna say something about the Beijing consensus. And this is kind of interesting because uh, we've been used to thinking about the so-called Washington consensus, which was promoted by the United States during its pe period of pretty uncontested hegemony. Uh, yes, the Soviet Union was around, but it wasn't an attractive role model. Uh, now there is a potential different role model. And unlike the Washington consensus, which was supposedly about promoting free trade, uh, uh, economic liberalization, those kinds of things. Uh, the, the Beijing consensus is a term that was dreamt up by this guy, Joshua Ramo. Uh, and it's a way of trying to describe how uh, China sees economic development uh, and goes about promoting economic development as well. Significantly, not that many people in China use this term. Uh, it's kind of something that's used by scholars outside of China more than inside, I think. But in reality, what it, what it boils down to is that uh, it's taking a fairly pragmatic approach to economic development. So unlike the Washington Consensus, which was very doctrinaire and had key ideas that American policymakers tried to promote uh, in the so-called developing world, in China's case, the, the Beijing Consensus seems to amount to doing whatever works. So there's no fixed ideological blueprint. Nobody's expecting uh, everybody in Africa to suddenly turn into car carrying Marxists. Uh, it's just doing whatever works uh, and not getting bogged down in uh, ideological uh, debates or insisting that uh, countries should become democratic uh, as part of the developmental process. And clearly, for a lot of countries around the world, the idea that you don't have to be a democracy to achieve successful development uh, is a very attractive kind of idea because uh, whatever you think about democracy, uh, it was uh, a kind of dominant paradigm for a while. It's now being wound back and there are a growing number of non-democracies in the world. And so for those countries, uh, the Beijing consensus or doing or adopting this kind of pragmatic approach to development is a pretty attractive sort of idea. Uh, and so this also gives China some potential leverage and even some potential so-called soft power, as uh, Joseph Nye famously described, the kind of influence of ideas and cultural practices that the Americans were able to exploit very successfully for a long period of time. It now seems, according to some people at least, that China might be able to enjoy a similar process of soft power or influence uh, as a consequence of its very successful domestic economic development experience uh, and the possibility at least that it may be possible to follow that in other parts of the world. And again, that's an open question and it's easier said than done, clearly. This is a model of, uh, or a, a representation of uh, China's so-called uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And I think the striking point about this is the sheer scale of this uh, project if it's successfully realized. And it's already being rolled out in quite a few different places. So there's a strong possibility, all other things being equal, uh, that it could be successfully rolled out. And the, the point of this is that uh, part of the process will be driven by Chinese corporations and indeed workers uh, going to some of these kinds of parts of the world and helping to install some of this infrastructure, but it will dramatically cut down uh, transport uh, times between China and other economies uh, around the world. It will help to literally cement China's place at the center of production networks uh, in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and maybe even uh, into uh, Europe uh, and other far-flung places as well. So if this is successfully rolled out uh, and becomes uh, a key part of domestic infrastructure in all of these very different parts of the world, 
on the one hand, it will spur economic development, we might expect, but it will also entrench China's influence in some of these countries, it's reasonable to expect, because they will be given uh, enhanced access to those markets uh, and influence uh, as a consequence of that. So it's a really big deal. It's much bigger than the Marshall Plan, which the Americans uh, were responsible for doing at arm's length uh, in Europe after the Second World War. And we've never seen anything quite like this in human history. So if it happens, if it's successful, it will be a very, very big deal uh, indeed. So let me just say something about the BRI and the Marshall Plan, because it's worth uh, comparing and contrasting, because uh, in some ways the, the Marshall Plan was quite small and quite local uh, by comparison. So the, the Beer Belt and Road, it's, it's difficult to overstate how ambitious and significant it could be if it's successfully realized. Uh, and uh, there are some real difficulties in doing such a, a mega project, uh, not the least lending money to countries uh, who may not be able to pay it back. That's become a bit of an issue. Uh, and some of the nervousness on the part of recipient countries about uh, being indebted to China and what that, that might be. But I think it's important to recognize just how ambitious it, ambitious it is. So it's, it's to be expected that there might be teething problems and difficulties in actually delivering on something as uh, ambitious as this particular plan. It's also uh, important to note that uh, China doesn't have the same kind of advantages that the United States did in the fact that it had these kind of Cold War allies who were supportive of American hegemony, uh, and that made it quite a bit easier for the Americans to, some would say, impose their will on other parts of the world and, and other countries. China has got, as I mentioned, lots of economic leverage, but it's difficult to always utilize that or to do it unproblematically. And there are famous examples, places like Sri Lanka, where there's been quite a bit of pushback uh, from uh, a lot of the local community who are concerned about growing Chinese influence, concerned about some of the uh, economic benefits that the BRI is generating not being spilling over to the local population because often Chinese labor force will do some of the literal heavy lifting in putting the Belt and Road in place. So there are some concerns about uh, who's benefiting. There are some concerns about so-called debt trap diplomacy uh, and owing China a lot of money and whether they'll be able to use that to leverage their political interests as well. Uh, but I think that uh, the most important and potentially encouraging part of the Belt and Road Initiative is the fact that uh, there's quite, been quite a lot of talk, and that's pretty much what it is so far, but there's been quite a lot of talk about linking the Belt and Road Initiative to questions of climate change and sustainable development. And that is exactly, I think, what the world needs at the moment. Because, as I said, I think that's the biggest change that we face. And if we don't think about economic development and climate change simultaneously uh, and about the links between the two, then I think the future doesn't look terribly bright, to put it mildly. And I'm happy to expand on this, but I should warn you in advance, my views on this are pretty gloomy and you might not want to hear them. But anyway, we can, we can think about that when we get to Q&A. This is just to reinforce the point that uh, this is about uh, investment in renewable energy. And you can see that uh, China is far and away the biggest investor in green, so-called green energy uh, in the world. Uh, and the question is, can they continue to do this at a domestic level? But even more importantly, perhaps, can they expand this very welcome uh, investment in green energy uh, around the world via the BRI. It's also worth pointing out that China is still the biggest emitter of CO2 emissions. Uh, China is still using and building uh, coal-fired power stations at the same time, because unfortunately, the great paradox and problem of economic development is when you have economic development, 
it almost inevitably requires more energy uh, and uh, there are a limited number of areas where you can get energy rapidly. China continues to rely heavily on coal. Uh, it's difficult to uh, break the coal habit immediately and overnight. So at the moment, uh, economic development is being uh, still associated with rises in CO2 emissions and contributing to global warming. So it's a real paradox that much needed and uh, desirable economic development inevitably seems to contribute to this bigger problem of climate change and global warming. But we can talk about that later as well. But as I say, China is a bit of a paradox because it's the biggest uh, renewable energy investor, but it's also the biggest contributor of CO2 emissions. So what might the, the green BRI look like and why am I so enthusiastic about it in principle, at least? It could be linked to uh, these sustainable development projects if uh, China is serious about encouraging uh, recipient nations uh, who are involved in the BRI project to really make their contributions sustainable uh, in, uh, at, at the same time as developing uh, economically. Now, China has some interesting ideas about this. Uh, this uh, Xi Jinping's talked about an ecological civilization, which sounds like a great idea and could be if it's realized, if public policy really does uh, put sustainable development first. Uh, but the reality is there was a terrible, for example, there was a terrible drought in China this year, as I'm sure you're all aware. And uh, that meant that they couldn't rely on uh, hydropower in the way that they had done. And they had to go back to using even more coal and building more coal fired power stations than they had before. So there are real constraints over what China is capable and willing to do domestically. Uh, and so there is a big question mark about whether the so-called green supply chain, which sounds like another great idea, will really be uh, prioritized if that clashes with domestic priorities, if that clashes with the supply of energy to domestic consumers. Uh, so I think the uh, CCP leadership is very conscious of the fact that they have to keep the economic development uh, process happening in China as well as the rest of the world. So there are real constraints. However, uh, in, the, in the literature associated with the BRI, there's something called an ecological red line policy. And this also sounds like a great idea. So the idea is that China won't fund or encourage development in areas and projects that cross this ecological red line policy and threaten uh, ecosystems and unsustainable uh, development. The question is, uh, is the Chinese government really willing to follow through on these uh, well-intentioned and noble sounding ideas? Significantly, there's no formal law regulating environment, environmental matters in Chinese overseas investments. So in other words, they are reliant on local actors and, and, ind and notionally independent firms to actually fulfill the regulatory kind of uh, initiatives uh, that are associated with sustainable development. But there's no capacity or it seems willingness to uh, formally uh, enshrine this in legal uh, uh, conditions that would force either Chinese companies or recipients of Chinese investment to behave in particular ways. So there's still a way to go uh, in realizing this potential and getting uh, uh, the recipients of this investment to behave in the right kind of way. The other possible problem, because there is some domestic uh, regulation in China that uh, can influence the behavior of domestic companies in China, will Chinese companies uh, decide to go elsewhere and to uh, move to so-called pollution havens where the rules and regulations are much less strict, where you can pollute 
with impunity uh, and get away with behavior that wouldn't be tolerated in China itself. So that question hasn't been answered yet either. Uh, and given the, the very demanding time frames that we all face uh, as a consequence of global warming, uh, there's not much time to get this right. So if the Chinese government is serious about, serious about this, they have to start acting very quickly and compelling people to behave in particular sorts of ways that are in harmony with uh, sustainable development practices. The other thing that's worth making, uh, uh, making a few observations about, which I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with, is that all of this is happening in a very difficult geopolitical uh, situation. So it's bad enough. We're all having to think about how do we solve climate change? How do we uh, encourage sustainable economic development? It will be difficult to do this at any moment in history, but unfortunately, we're at a pretty difficult moment in history. Some, th some think the most difficult moment in history since the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. The, what we can say is that uh, this influential uh, idea, the Thucydides trap, has been championed by a chap called Graham Allison, a prominent American academic. And his thesis is the rising powers, like China, are inevitably unhappy about the way the world is organized at the moment. They don't think that their ideas, their views, their position is taken as seriously as it should be. They don't have the respect or the face, if you like, that they are uh, entitled to, and they want to change the status quo. They want their ideas, their norms, they want the Beijing consensus, if you like, to be the kind of ruling policy paradigm uh, that shapes the way that uh, countries behave in the international system. Now, according to Graham Allison and others, uh, the declining hegemon, in this case, the United States, can't accept that it may no longer have this kind of unipolar uh, position in which it's able to uh, perhaps dictate, certainly impose itself on the rest of the world and shape the international system in ways that suit its preferences rather than anybody else's. So that's a problem, according to people like Allison, because the only way that this can be resolved, history suggests, is through uh, conflict and direct military competition. Now, we all hope that that's not going to be the case. Uh, the unfortunate outbreak of war in Europe suggests that we can't rule anything out. If you'd asked me a couple of years ago, is war in Europe possible? I would have said absolutely not. People are not that stupid anymore. We've learned some big lessons from history. We're not gonna make the same kinds of mistakes again. How wrong can you be? So maybe uh, I shouldn't be too confident about uh, peace and tranquility continuing between China and the United States either, but it would be completely and utterly stupid. There would be no winners, and clearly there's got to be better ways of acting, and this is the big hope about global governance. Uh, but even if we accept that a peaceful uh, competition is better than a military competition, uh, there are still going to be competition about the precise nature of the rules and norms that govern the international system. And this is why the Americans are always chatting about the so-called uh, rules-based international order. Uh, outsiders will say, well, it's your rules, your order. We don't like it. So what do the people who are unhappy do in the circumstances where the international system is dominated by the kind of usual suspects, the United States uh, and its allies. Do we need to, or does China or anybody else need to uh, try and resolve these tensions through war? Clearly, Russia thinks that's still a useful way of trying to resolve uh, international circumstances, which it doesn't like, which it's unhappy about. Uh, and we're living through a demonstration of just how mad, uh, and uh, unlikely that is, but it doesn't stop it from happening, unfortunately. So that's the big uh, tension uh, between China and the United States. Can they come to a new way of living together or will there be an inevitable struggle as the US declines and China continues 
uh, to rise. The other possibility that people have suggested is that we're now on the beginning or at the beginning uh, of a new Cold War uh, that uh, looks a little bit like the Cold War between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union. But I think it's very different in many interesting and potentially encouraging sorts of ways. As I mentioned before, there was very little uh, economic interaction between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. And that's very different to the relationship between China and the United States, even though it's changing a bit. There are plenty of people in the United States who are very keen for the uh, economic relationship with China to continue and to be successful because they're making a lot of money out of it. And that's what capitalism is always uh, about. And China, although it's very uh, controversial to describe China as a capitalist economy, that's what it looks like to me, I have to say, uh, even with Chinese characteristics, uh, but that's a significant point because the big context between China and the United States is non-ideological to some extent. China is not looking to overthrow capitalism, I don't think, and impose some kind of Marxist utopia. Uh, it's pretty happy making money out of this kind of basically capitalist international order. The big question is about the precise type of uh, capitalism uh, that uh, different countries might follow and the sorts of rules, norms and processes that might govern international capitalist interaction between the big economies uh, of the world. And some people have talked about the possibility of a so-called G2 between the United States uh, and China, uh, which could play a much bigger and more constructive role in the international system as the two biggest economies in the world and the two uh, principal uh, military powers in the world, uh, they are clearly going to have a huge impact on the way the world works for the foreseeable future. The question is, can they act uh, cooperatively? Can the ties of economic integration uh, work to pacify their relations? And will interdependence mean that they simply won't want to risk conflict because they both have too much to lose. So that's a potentially good thing, an encouraging thing. Uh, the question is, will it be enough to overcome the uncertainties, the hostilities, the suspicions that both sides have about the other and which make real uh, global cooperation very, very difficult uh, at the moment? Uh, what's happening to my thing here? Here we go. So the other point to make, I think, is uh, when we're talking about global governance, we're, uh, there's an assumption, particularly in the West, that it has to be democratic, that it couldn't possibly be any kind of global governance that wasn't dominated or driven by the democratic powers and democratic uh, uh, principles. Uh, and I have to say that I am quite a fan of democracy. And as Churchill famously said, it's the best system compared to all of the others. Uh, but uh, that may not be setting the bar terribly high. Uh, but perhaps it doesn't have to be uh, entirely democratic to be effective. Uh, there are uh, examples of international institutions uh, that uh, are include non-democratic countries. We've got the, the so-called BRICS uh, countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, possibly South Africa, uh, a couple of non-democratic countries in those. Uh, we've got uh, countries that are only partially democratic, uh, like Turkey has got a fairly authoritarian ruler, but it's part of NATO. Uh, Mr. Putin uh, is putting all of these uh, issues to a major test at the moment. And if we look at what's happened uh, as a consequence of Russia's invasion, invasion of Ukraine, uh, you might think that the prospects for global governance don't look good at all when some countries are prepared to uh, risk destroying the international system to pursue exclusively uh, national ends. Uh, so this is a real test of the international system. I think the good news is that it's helped to rally 
uh, Europe and the United States, uh, get them to behave more cohesively. You may not think that the rise of Western powers or the reun reunification of Western powers is a good thing, but it does demonstrate that under particular circumstances, greater levels of cooperation are possible, at least among some countries. So, and I think that has to be uh, taken as an encouraging thing, no matter who the countries are, more cooperation, I think, has got to be better than less uh, cooperation. The question is, can you have cooperation between democratic uh, and non-democratic, authoritarian, if you like, regimes at the same time in pursuit of common interest, like uh, addressing climate change uh, for a start? Because whatever you think about uh, climate change, it's the greatest collective action problem we have ever faced as a species and no country, not the United States, not China, certainly not Australia, can fix it on its own. The only way we're going to get out of this um, tremendously difficult set of problems is by acting uh, cooperatively and collectively. Uh, I'm not wildly optimistic about our chances of doing this, but that's what needs to be done. So unless we can overcome some of these debates about democracies are better than authoritarian regimes, et cetera, et cetera, and recognize that whatever kind of regime we have, we have to cooperate if we're going to get anywhere, then uh, I think we're all in pretty serious kind of trouble, unfortunately. So to sum up, this is my last slide. Uh, so, so what do we think about Chinese leadership? And I'll be very interested to hear what you all think about this. So uh, can China lead? Undoubtedly, yes, in uh, theory. Uh, because it's a country like any other, it's very powerful, uh, it has economic levers that it can pull and influence people with, it's a very powerful military uh, actor, but it's worth thinking about the limits of, uh, of uh, military power. And I think, you know, the one kind of good thing, if there's anything that's good that's come out of this, about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's demonstrated uh, even to somebody of limited intellectual capacities like Mr. Putin, uh, that military power is not uh, something that can be relied upon uh, to fulfill national interests and goals. Uh, it's, it, you know, the great irony about American hegemony was they were undoubtedly overwhelming, and they still are, overwhelmingly the most powerful military force the world has ever seen, but they couldn't uh, ex exert their will in uh, Iraq. They left uh, Afghanistan in a shambles and a shameful hurry. Uh, and it's difficult for uh, military, you know, even the most advanced military power to be able to get their way in a complex interdependent world where everybody is to some extent at least reliant on everybody else uh, for their future uh, welfare. So, you know, maybe we're at a moment in history where we don't want any kind of single uh, nation leading the world, uh, if that's what indeed the Americans did, uh, because we're in a kind of post unipolar, post bipolar. Uh, we have to be multipolar, we have to be cooperative if we're going to succeed. And the big question is about getting the two most powerful countries in the world to cooperate and to see that uh, without the cooperation of each other, we're not going to solve some of these problems. And there will be no winners in a world where climate change is not fixed. On the contrary, some of the uh, traditional forms of security uh, concern, I think, will re-emerge uh, because we're going to have to deal with climate change refugees. We're going to have to divide uh, deal with social unrest within individual countries as the climate situation gets worse and worse, uh, as it is at the moment, and it's accelerating much more quickly than even some of the most pessimistic climate change scientists suggested only a few years ago. So, you know, unless we kind of recognize what the real threats and challenges are to the world and the need for cooperation, particularly between China and the United States, we're not going to get anywhere. Australia could actually play a useful role, I think, in this, but it's one that most Australian policymakers uh, would deny, don't want to hear about. But Australia could actually encourage the United States 
to behave more cooperatively than it sometimes does. Because it's worth remembering that the United States has a bit of a habit of invading other countries, throwing its weight about, telling people what to do, acting in ways that suit American uh, national interests, even when they don't suit everybody else's. And that's the problem that goes with being a leader and hegemonic power. There's always a temptation to use your overwhelming power and influence for national goals. Now, maybe that might have worked in some periods of history, but I would suggest to you that it's not going to work now. Because the reality is that unless we put national goals to one side or recognize that national goals are actually collective goals and know we have to do something about climate change first, then I think basically uh, the future doesn't look too good. So on that cheery and optimistic note, I might call it a day and I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Mark Eason for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I believe we will all learn a lot uh, from your insightful um, lecture, especially uh, for me, the most interesting and impressive part was your uh, lecture about um, the green BRI. I think that's certainly something we can all be uh, looking at, uh, which is fascinating. Now, uh, let's turn to the Q&A session of today's Q&A session. So as I said, if you have questions, please raise your hand. And I will uh, I will try to maintain the order of the Q&A session. Please try to make your question as precise, as straightforward as possible. Thank you. Any questions so far? Uh, JD, yes, please. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu, and, and thank you, uh, Professor Beeson, for that wonderful uh, talk. Uh, I think at the last uh, uh, point, you raised this uh, critical question, you know, can China be a leader uh, or lead the world? Uh, another way of uh, also asking uh, this question is, is China willing? I mean, even if it can, is China willing? If we can follow the, the parallel, the, the US leadership uh, over the last uh, 70 years, uh, there are certain uh, indicators there. So you, you, you have to be willing to open up your, your market as a, sort of the last resort. Uh, you are willing to uh, contribute a lot of resources uh, and not really, you know, uh, making any uh, sort of getting any benefit in the short term. But overall, of course, structurally, uh, you get the benefit because that gave you uh, sort of more, uh, you know, recognition of your soft power. And uh, so, uh, so in that regard, so you still uh, gain. And then of course, uh, in the U.S. Uh, case, uh, it has uh, uh, its, its currency that is, uh, you know, help, it helps it to, to maintain that leadership. So if we look at China today, uh, it has some of these qualities, uh, but it does not have enough of those. Uh, and then that, well, uh, China is willing to put into in order to uh, make it uh, a leader. The Beijing consensus is, uh, is interesting. Uh, a lot of countries want to uh, follow, obviously. Uh, but would that be the model? Uh, I, I think uh, it's uh, kind of a very soon generous uh, in, in that regard, China, Beijing uh, consensus, that particular model of development and governance uh, is very unique to, to mm -hmm. China. So I still have some. Uh, I'm hopeful, but I uh, still have uh, some uh, reservations, uh, you know, when I look at China. Uh, so of course, a lot of initiatives, global development initiative, global uh, security initiative, BRI, shared, uh, you know, uh, destiny, common destiny. And, uh, so a lot of good ideas, mm -hmm. but I think it will be a challenge for China to put the ideas into practice as you, uh, you know, recognized uh, at the end. Yeah, thank you.
<laughs> thanks, thanks, Jing Dong. Great to see you again. Anyway, by the way, so uh, nice, <laughs> nice to catch up again. But no, excellent, excellent point. I think one my thinking about this for all it's worth. Anyway, and I don't think anybody knows quite what the answer to these questions are. I think that's what we have to say. We have to be modest about you know what we can say because we're grappling with a whole series of completely different questions than we're used to facing. The climate change thing is the most spectacularly obvious and different thing about because about the future, <laughs> future of humanity and its you know capacity to be able to live sustainably in the environment we're given. And that's a it's a pretty big question. But even the, the kind of more technical challenges that you mentioned about uh, the hegemonic power of the era playing a kind of leadership role, I think that's kind of changed as well because it's worth remembering that in the aftermath of the Second World War, when the United States became the hegemonic power of the era, it did play, even if you don't like America and think its foreign policy is terrible and all those kinds of things, which plenty of people do uh, outside the West, even if you think all of that's true, at one level, it did play this crucial leadership role. And there's a famous American uh, economist called Charles Kindleberger, who said that you need a country uh, a leader, leader, uh, a leading country to provide certain collective goods at the economic level, like a, a useful uh, common currency, uh, a, a, a predictable form of uh, arena for market transactions to take place in a sort of institutionalized norms that people could subscribe to and uh, act in uh, concert with. So all of those things, the argument went, America provided at the height of its hegemonic powers. And that's why we had this era of unprecedented growth uh, and rising living standards uh, of which, you know, when China joined the WTO, that kick-started or accelerated even more China's growth as well. So clearly uh, at the level of uh, the technical issues of what underpins economic development at any time whatever the americans and their allies were doing at that time worked pretty successfully and underpinned economic development throughout east asia and into china the question is do those kind of same principles uh, and same uh, demands are they as important as they once were are they deliverable uh, or crucially in my view are there more important things that we should be focusing on uh, other than uh, just what it, what is the best framework for promoting economic development, whether you call it the Washington Consensus or the Beijing Consensus. I think that is now a second order issue. The, the key thing we have to think about is what are the conditions in which we're going to survive in a relatively civilized state, whether it's in an authoritarian regime or a democratic regime or something else. Uh, that's the kind of fundamental existential question and challenge that we face these days that our policymakers, I just don't think they can quite get their heads around what a big issue this is and how limited the time is. And this is not just a criticism of the United States, China, Australia. I mean, it's a question that everybody needs to think about really seriously. And we keep having these meetings, uh, which is kind of good because I'm a big fan of multilateralism and negotiations and discussions, but nothing significant is really happening uh, that's going to, I think, address the problems in the kind of space and time that we have available. And unfortunately, I think policymakers, understandably, are still kind of locked in that, you know, how do we keep economic development going? What's the best structure for ensuring that economic development is successful and that the global economy is expanding? And I think there's a fundamental question about whether that is still possible, certainly in the way that we've been used to doing it, i.e. building more factories, building more energy uh, consuming kinds of uh, forces of uh, development, whether that is actually any longer possible or sustainable. It's an absolutely open question, it seems to me, but one that policymakers everywhere, and Australia is one of the worst examples of this, because if Australia can't address this problem seriously, we're the driest continent on the planet. We're having some of the most dramatic uh, effects of drought, uh, flood, uh, everything, species annihilation. So Australia is one of the worst offenders, and yet Australia, can do nothing constructive to contribute to this. Uh, Australia is spending all its time uh, having 
uh, nervous breakdown about the rise of China, the need to get new submarines, uh, to spend money we don't have on improbable threats that probably won't materialize. Uh, and in the meantime, when these submarines and various other things, I can talk about this at great length if you're interested, but by the time these things arrive, 40 years time, the environment uh, may be unlivable. So, I mean, we need a dramatic paradigm shift amongst ruling elites everywhere around the world. I'm just not optimistic it's going to happen, I'm afraid. So I think, you know, the debate about is it a technical fix, getting the economic, you know, uh, parameters in place? I don't think that's the issue. We're going to have a fundamental rethink about is economic growth any longer the principal issue we should be focusing on? Thank you. Thank you, Prof Professor Mark Beeson, uh, for the answer. Also, also, thank you, Associate Professor Jing Dongyuan, for the question. Actually, uh, Professor Yuan is my supervisor, so <laughs> <laughs> very, very happy uh, that he- Very lucky. Uh, very lucky as well, yeah. He could be here today with us. So I think uh, I think certainly the, the, the question uh, Professor Jing Dongyuan uh, raised, the ability and the willingness for China to providing those uh, collective goods is certainly something uh, we should be looking at because obviously the ability and willingness to provide public goods is one of the uh, uh, like fun fundamental basis of uh, of uh, hegemonic order or or according to Cohen the, the uh, foundation of uh, hegemonic stability if you like I think certainly that's a very important important question to ask. Also, I think Professor Mark Beeson has talked about uh, like now we, we've we already entered a period of a period of exceptional, uh, uh, it's already a, like third um, climate change, climate crisis, it's already a third order thing, third order issue rather than a second order issue. Like uh, we cannot maintain the business as Euro, we cannot maintain uh, uh, like a period, so-called period of normal. We are now entering a period of uh, a crisis-driven uh, new, like shifting diagram. Diagram. I think that's a very important insight. I've learned a lot from this uh, discussion myself. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, okay. Are there any other questions? Any questions you guys want? You, Nate, yes, please. Yes, uh, hi, Professor Beeson. I myself have a um, question regarding your um, last point about Australia's role between China and the US, the power struggle. So as I understand, Australia, UK, Canada, and New Zealand, um, these countries are close allies with the US, but they're also, um, pressured allies, exploited allies um, of the US in terms of national security. And um, they're all subject to US international agenda. For example, um, the UK has to refuse Huawei as 5G provider because of um, US influence. So um, do you think, is there a um, any possibility that these countries take a more um, pro-China or neutral stand um, in this power struggle, more like, for example, um, Singapore's position in the power struggle. I know um, New Zealand is more um, neutral in terms of, I mean, compare New Zealand with other um, Five Eyes countries because it obviously withdrew from um, ANZ, ANZ, Um It's less dependent on US um, in terms of its security. Oh, it's a good question. Now, the I think Australia's position is very distinctive, and uh, it's partly a function of history that uh, Australia is famously an ex-British colony, a long way from home countries, and it's always looked for what Bob meant is described as great and powerful friends to underpin its security, because policymakers in Australia have always been very nervous about their position in the world, literally, geographically, and about the, uh, the fact that Asia is in inverted commas close to them and, and a lot of policymakers in australia didn't understand asia well felt well and felt nervous about it and so there's this historical legacy i think which helps to explain why 
Australia's always been a bit paranoid about security and very concerned about its place in the world. And I think uh, there was there were encouraging signs in the 1980s and 1990s when there was a shift economically in Australia from uh, towards Asia and the recognition that Australia's economic future, at least, was bound up with the rise of China and Japan and other countries in East Asia. And this was a good thing. And I think for a while, there was quite a kind of progressive idea about what relations with quote unquote Asia and uh, countries like China would look like. Uh, but I think unfortunately, uh, that's changed a lot over the last few years as China has been seen to become a more threatening uh, military uh, force in the region. Now, it's interesting for people like me, I consider myself, I like to think of myself as being a kind of independent commentator on some of these issues. And I've been fairly critical about Australia's closeness to and unthinking reliance on uh, the United States and the fact that it's been involved in wars that have got absolutely nothing to do with uh, Australia whatsoever in strategic terms, it seems to me. Uh, but this is a very uh, marginal, somewhat eccentric view and the overwhelming dominant position in Australia. If you listen to Penny Wong's speech today in the United States, uh, it's very much about supporting the United States, having a collective position. And the thing that you mentioned, AUKUS, which includes the United Kingdom as well. I mean, this strikes me as being almost laughable in some ways because the United Kingdom has no real geopolitical interests in this part of the world these days. And to suggest that they do, as I think a, a slightly ludicrous throwback to an imperial era when the, when the United Kingdom was uh, a, an important imperial power, but it is no longer. And the fact that Australia is tying itself so closely to uh, what some people have described as uh, Anglosphere nations, uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, is, I think, uh, an unhelpful retrograde step that allows people in China uh, to dismiss Australia as an independent foreign policy actor and to suggest that it just does whatever its uh, Anglosphere uh, allies do, particularly the United States. And I think there's some merit in there. So, you know, my principal criticism of this is that I think that Australia could and indeed should have a more independent uh, foreign policy position. This doesn't mean to say that they're suddenly going to become allies with China. That's not going to happen, clearly. But they could be independent. They could offer uh, advice to the United States when it gets involved in uh, unnecessary wars like the invasion of Iraq, which Australia strongly supported at the time and uh, with troops as well. So I think wise counsel when countries behave badly from genuinely independent countries could be a valuable uh, and useful thing. And there is absolutely no need, it seems to me, uh, for Australia to take high profile anti-China positions uh, because it plays well with the domestic audience. To be fair, the Albanese government is nothing like as bad as the Morrison government was. Uh, so that's a hopeful sign and there have been uh, meetings between Albanese and Xi and the foreign ministers as well, and that's a good thing. So talking is good, uh, but I think uh, Australian uh, influence would be much greater if it was a more genuinely independent country capable of making its own decisions about what it would like uh, the region to look like, what it would like its foreign policy look, to look like, and encouraging good behaviour on the part of more powerful countries like China, but also like the United States, which is still prone to doing some foolish things at times. And maybe some quiet counsel from a respected friend might be useful at times too. But that's probably wishful thinking on my part, I think. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Nate. I think that's a very good question, especially uh, when I heard uh, Professor Mark Beeson said that uh, the U United Kingdom has no real interest in this part of the world, which reminds me that like Richard Lavaud once said, uh, the reason why the UK and the France still maintain their large amount of uh, 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 nuclear weapon 
Arsenosis because it's a problem of prestige, not a problem of national security. I think that's certainly uh, something for us to think about. And also, I, I, I totally agree that Australia should have a more balanced foreign policy, especially between uh, the company, especially in the era of uh, the like competition between the United States and China. I mm -hmm. think that certainly better suits um, uh, Australia's national interests. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Thank you. Uh, are there any um, questions? Any more questions? Uh, yes, please, Teddy. Yes, please. Oh, hi, Professor. Hi, Professor Bison. Uh, I just got a question related to the COVID. You know, during the pandemic, the China's economy has recovered like quite well, you know, at the beginning of the COVID. But, you know, like, like currently, you know, I think other countries have, like have been catching up. So what do you reckon about, so what do you think about the, the, how does the COVID change the global leadership, also the China's global influence? So this is the COVID question, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's related to the COVID. So at one level, uh, I think we all have to sort of, uh, well, those of us who aren't medical practitioners or experts on uh, transmission of diseases have to uh, accept the advice uh, of different experts about what is the best way to deal with some of these things and about the, uh, the nature of the disease and the problems that we're confronting. Uh, having said that, I think it's clear that uh, for many uh, countries in the West, the worst is now over and that we're learning to live with COVID in a way uh, that doesn't seem to be too uh, difficult as far as uh, death rates and infections are concerned, and it's becoming not much worse than the flu. So that's kind of good for the West. I mean, it, there's been some terrible problem. I mean, the Americans lost over a million people, I think I'm right in saying, during the course of this. So that is not a good result. But now, uh, I think a lot of people think the conventional wisdom is that this is the way to management, manage it, get people vaccinated, uh, get them prepared for opening up, and then we can all learn to live with it. Now, the problem for China, of course, is that Xi Jinping in particular has made a big thing about China's handling this much better than everybody else, uh, that death rates in China are much lower, that America was a, you know, a terrible example of what to do and a mistake. And so there's a lot of political capital and prestige has been invested in this particular public policy issue. And unfortunately for Xi Jinping, and maybe for China too, uh, it's now becoming clear that not everybody in China supports uh, the policies that are being uh, imposed. And there are serious doubts and quite reasonable doubts about the effectiveness uh, and the necessity of some of the policies that have been rolled out in China. Now, as I say, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I am interested in the kind of political uh, ramifications of this. And I think for the CCP and for Xi Jinping in particular, this is a really big challenge. How do you get out of, uh, he's painted himself into a corner, to use that famous ex English expression, and it's difficult to see quite how you get out of this without losing a lot of face. Uh, now, the, the problems are the social unrest in China around this issue, and that in itself is remarkable, uh, so to some extent, unexpected and problematic. If you're trying to uh, create uh, the impression of a unified country, all supporting the CCP, all on board with a particular message about uh, how China is handling this, that's superior to the rest of the world, and it doesn't work anymore, or doesn't, doesn't have the support of the popular support of the masses, then that's a real problem. Uh, so it's not clear to me at least how China exits from this gracefully, because I believe that there are questions about the number of old people who've been vaccinated, questions about the efficacy of Chinese vaccinations and various other things, which I'm not an expert on, but which people who are experts say there are real issues about this and and about what might happen. So I think it's 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 unfortunate uh, for China and uh, it's unfortunate for Xi Jinping too that things have played out this way. But uh, you know, it's one of the kind of uh, 
problems with, uh, of, well, I think if we're allowed to say this, authoritarian regimes, uh, when uh, things go wrong uh, and when confidence is undermined, it can be more of a problem than it, than it is for democracies. Because one of the you know, good things about democracies is uh, they uh, are capable of absorbing shocks uh, in a way that authoritarian regimes uh, may not be. And, you know, a million people dying in the United States, it's a pretty big shock. It's a pretty big uh, uh, indictment of American public policy and capacity to deal effectively with the crisis in America. And yet uh, it didn't cause that much domestic trouble or problems. There's, you know, people, some people were unhappy about it. There were people complaining about having to get vaccinated, but there wasn't, uh, you know, rioting in the streets and things. So, uh, so anyway, it's a, you know, the, the interesting thing about COVID, I think, uh, is that it's a great test of comparative public policy and who has the most uh, effective ability to be able to respond to these issues, which is also worth pointing out, uh, unless you're a subscriber to the germ warfare thesis, it seems pretty clear that the uh, original disease was spread by bats in markets and things, and it was an accident, but it speaks to human beings' closer interaction with the natural world as populations expand outwards into formerly pristine parts of the natural environment, and we get uh, the consequence of this. And this happens all over the world with different diseases, you know, SARS, Ebola, whatever, they are all in part a consequence of our growing interaction with the formerly natural untouched world and we are paying a price for it. So that again, I think is the important lesson from this to try to think about, you know, what are we doing to the natural world that is having this kind of uh, impact on our very lives and the way that we behave, no matter what kind of uh, political system we may subscribe to, uh, even though this is pro providing a pretty uh, important test of effective public policy around the world. And it's still not clear uh, which country has been doing best in all of this, but it is clear that it's going to be a bit of a problem for the Chinese leadership to get out of this situation gracefully, I think. Thank you, Tidy. Thank you, uh, Professor Beeson. I, th I think I think uh, this is a very important uh, question to ask, and certainly there will be a lot of uh, political ramifications for, mm -hmm. for China, uh, I would say. I, I totally agree with you. And certainly COVID is a, is a very good uh, testing ground for comparative public policy. I totally agree with it. Thank you. Um, who has questions? Uh, JD, yes, yes please. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, I'd like to follow up on an earlier point about, uh, you know, Mark, you mentioned this, you know, where uh, we don't pay enough attention to uh, the environment and uh, we are, you know, chasing of those other things, you know, including, you know, economic uh, development, which is important and good, uh, but at what cost, you mm -hmm. know, to the nature and to our very future. You know, when I think about this, uh, you know, uh, why politicians are uh, very hesitant and slow in dealing with the climate change situation, I, I think perhaps there's a, you know, kind of very political structure or, or system uh, basically discourage politicians uh, from taking, uh, you know, a, a adopting policies which will have major trade-offs uh, for the short term. Uh, but the, the long term is good, but because of the electoral cycles, mm. uh, so you, you can't afford to have those, you know, policies that will have a negative impact on economic development. So you are punished, uh, you know, for it. Uh, you lose your, your job, you know, you're out of uh, the office. So that's, I think, the, the very nature you know, of political system in democratic countries. Mm -hmm. But that then you will think, oh, okay, in authoritarian, you know, more, you know, centrally controlled state, that would be easy, you know, saying they don't have to go through the motion of, uh, you know, election. Uh, 
But there, the, the problem is because they don't need the election, so they don't really care about what affects people the most. You know, so they, they pursue other things like prestige and power, you know, competition with other uh, powers. So, so in both system, neither supports, you know, offer incentives to uh, get the politicians to make the commitment, the long-term commitment at even even though they will sacrifice, you know, even their offices, uh, but it's good for the future, for the, you know, uh, our ecosystem and for the humanity. But it's mm. very difficult, very tough call, you know. It and is. yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. About ten years ago, I wrote an article called uh, "The Coming of Environmental Authoritarianism." I don't know if you've read it. I'll send you a copy if you're interested. But uh, but I but the but the the argument in this paper was that uh, I was looking at East Asia, uh, and I was just I was, even then I was very concerned about the state of the environment. And the argument was that on the one hand, uh, if uh, the environment gets worse then there's a possibility that uh, East Asian states might kind of return to or double down on a form of authoritarian rule that would allow them to sort of suppress uprisings uh, around the environment or to control social unrest or, or on a more optimistic note, they might even be able to, to overcome the problem of democratic rule that you that you mentioned, because clearly that is a problem when in Australia you've got a three year electoral cycle. And so, you know, sooner had one election than you're worrying about the next one. And nobody wants to do anything that's going to alarm the voters by uh, suggesting that we need to change dramatically in the way that we behave and act and those kinds of things. So democracies have a real weakness, I think, in addressing long term problems. However, authoritarian regimes in principle and i'm not saying we all should become authoritarian but in principle they can make those kind of big decisions of just tell people this is what we're doing because we need to do it for example i think i'm right in saying that the chinese central government has told polluting industries around places like beijing and shanghai they've got to move they've got to go somewhere else and so they've all gone off into the west of the country and they're polluting over there they're doing dreadful things but no but the but the large numbers of middle class people in places like uh, Beijing aren't upset by all this pollution anymore. They're not going to start making social protests. Uh, and it's a way of dealing with that kind of pro problem. And they could compel the coal industry to shut down in China if they wanted to. I don't think they will, but they could compel the coal industry to shut down in a way that is simply not going to happen in Australia. Because in Australia, the debate, uh, the fossil fuel companies often give political donations to uh, political parties in this country. Uh, many of the representatives of coal electorates would be horrified at the idea of closing down the coal industry in Australia because of the jobs and those kinds of things. So we're kind of locked in a situation where, particularly in some of the democracies like Australia, where everybody has a kind of vested interest in a particular form of uh, organizing economic activity in particular, uh, that's very difficult to break or even to present an alternative model uh, that might replace that uh, in a considered way. And the problem, of course, is the longer we fail to act, the more difficult it will be to successfully make that kind of uh, transition. And, you know, there are models out there on a more positive and optimistic note. This is a great book uh, written by uh, a prominent Australian economist, Ross Garno, called uh, Superpower. And it lays out how Australia could become the clean energy superpower of Asia and provide uh, reliable, sustainable energy, not only for us, but for much of uh, industrializing Asia as well. So there are models, there are possibilities, uh, but you have to overcome powerful vested interests in countries like Australia, in China. You have to make that kind of transition and keep the economic development process going because you know my reading of China, and you may know more about this than I do, and I'm sure you do, and many in the audience, but my, my reading of China is that the legitimacy of the CCP 
and Xi Jinping is still very much bound up with keeping economic development going, uh, you know, rising middle class, rising living standards, those kinds of things. They've been able to deliver that in a fantastic and historically unprecedented way. The question is, can they continue to do, do so, particularly when it's uh, having a dramatic and uh, unfortunate effect on the natural environment? So there's a real challenge and a real paradox there, but maybe, you know, authoritarian regimes may be actually better positioned to deal with uh, restructuring and certainly maybe better re positioned to deal with the unfortunate consequences of uh, un uncontrolled climate change, because we're going to see what this looks like in the not too distant future, I think, and that'll be another critical test of comparative public policy, which I don't particularly want to see, but I think we may get to. Thank you, JD. Thank you, uh, Professor Mark Beeson. I think this is, a, is, this is a very important, very interesting discussion. So I, I, I agree. I think uh, obviously uh, democracies, they have, uh, they, they have to face the democratic leaders, they have to face the electoral circles. Um, and I agree with um, Professor um, Mark Beeson that they have the natural inherent limit uh, to address long-term issues. But in the same time, as JD pointed out, uh, authoritarian regimes didn't do the job very well as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting uh, paradox there. So yeah, that's a very, very interesting discussion itself. Are, are there any other questions? If not, can I take the opportunity to ask one question? Because sure. I really want to hear your thoughts on this. Um, when, when, when people are talking about BRI, things like Belt and Road Initiative, uh, most of the Western media coverage are talking about uh, the debt trap, uh, debt trap diplomacy thing. And most Western commentators seem to believe that's the thing, that's the case, that's, that's real. But some other people, including uh, like uh, Mahabubani, uh, like also Australian political eco economics, uh, Shahar Hamili, those people believe there's no such thing called uh, debt trap diplomacy. What's your take on? What do you think? Uh, I, I think having some economic leverage over other countries uh, will flow from the kinds of investments and the kind of prospect of useful investment uh, that China is promising. So I think at one level, there will be some kind of leverage. I think that the debt trap diplomacy thing is pretty specific. And uh, I think it has been overstated in the West for sort of ideological reasons. But uh, but I think, the, you know, the point to make, and this is where comparative politics and historical uh, comparisons are really useful. Because, I mean, if you think about Europeans uh, and their colonial uh, moments, in Africa, for example, in the 19th century, they didn't leave much behind when they went there. They certainly exploited the local population. I mean, some of them are driven to slavery. They certainly exploited the resources, but they didn't leave much behind. It was of much use to the local populations. By contrast, whenever you think about China's uh, investment strategies and the kinds of things that they're doing, at least they're going to leave behind some railways. I mean, even if they only leave behind some football stadiums and a palace for the local despot, it's better than the Europeans left behind. And that's, I mean, I'm being a bit sort of facetious there, but you, but you, you take my point that the, some of the investment is undoubtedly badly needed. Uh, some of it is going to be pretty effective if it in, you know provides much needed uh, transportation links in places like Indonesia and uh, through Southeast Asia and Central Asia. I mean, all of this stuff is uh, vitally important, important for underpinning economic development. And, and it's, it's a part of the world that the Europeans and the Americans have never taken the slightest interest in, in the same kind of way and actually providing useful infrastructure. You know, the paradox is, and the unfortunate aspect of this, of course, is that it's happening a bit late in terms of the, the global development sort of problem and paradigm. If, the, if this had happened uh, maybe, you know, 50, 60 years ago, it would have been, it would have transformed, you know, various parts of the world in useful ways, but maybe we would have been facing these kinds of 
environmental questions and dilemmas much earlier than we than we have been. But I think you know this is going to be a really important problem for everybody uh, in the future because you know my guess is, and that's all it is. I mean, nobody knows, but my guess is that uh, even with uh, the kind of necessary infrastructure investment that's now happening in parts of Africa and Central Asia. I just cannot imagine the circumstances uh, in which the lifestyles and the economic prospects of the populations of those countries are ever going to match anything that looks remotely like the lifestyle that we enjoy in Australia, because uh, if they do, they're going to have the same kind of impact on the natural environment that we do, because we are part of the problem in living in you know, countries like Australia, because we consume much more than our fair share. We fly around the world between countries. We think nothing of studying. I'm one of the worst offenders. I've done much more than my fair share of traveling around the world and consuming resources over the course of my life. And uh, so, you know, it's a real challenge to change individual incentive structures, not to mention collective ones at the level of either the nation state or more importantly, and more necessarily at the level of the of global governance, which is kind of where we, we started. So, you know, if we can do it individually, I mean, I'm not wildly optimistic about our chances of doing it on the kind of uh, international stage where countries, rightly or wrongly, are still very much focused on, you know, what's our national interest in this? How are we going to benefit from this? You know, and that's a really difficult thing for people to change. And, you know, maybe one hope is we were talking about the role of experts in the COVID problem earlier on. I mean, there are plenty of experts on climate science, on biodiversity, on the kinds of uh, circumstances in which a more sustainable form of development could be uh, adopted in which, uh, you know, biodiversity might be sustainable for longer. There are plenty of good ideas out there. The challenge is, you know, to get them taken seriously, put on the agenda, and to actually be the central planks of development processes around the world, not just in China or Australia or whatever, and to recognize that this is, you know, if it's not a collective endeavor, it's not going to work. I think it's as simple as that. So this is a big chance for China to show leadership. And, you know, if they can point to, for example, a sustainable Belt and Road initiative that actually looks sustainable is actually associated with uh, practices that might not have occurred without a bit of Chinese influence and and perhaps even a bit of uh, mild coercion in the form of economic geoeconomic leverage then you've got to kind of you know push people into behaving better and in more sustainable ways so it's an unbelievably difficult challenge but this is China's uh, opportunity to uh, to do something, uh, you know, really interesting and distinctive. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you, I don't know, I wrote something recently and it was much more in hope than expectation. But I suggested that, you know, if Xi Jinping really wants to play an important leadership role, he should tell Putin to have a bit of a rethink about what's going on in Ukraine, because he's one of the few people in the world who probably has the slightest influence over Putin at the moment. And then the second thing he could do is he could tell the Ukrainians, we'll come over and we'll re help rebuild your cities for you because there's a lot of surplus building capacity in mainland China. They could send over an army of workers and help rebuild those trashed Ukrainian uh, cities. That would be a pretty good expression of uh, Chinese leadership and forethought and commitment to the future, but I'm not holding my breath, as they say. Thank you, Professor Mark Beeson. I think your, especially your final like remarks uh, about uh, how how to like show great leadership uh, for China to tell Putin to think about the war again, also to help to rebuild Ukraine, also for China uh, to show its leadership in terms of uh, global environmental uh, mm. governance. I think that's certainly something very insightful, and uh, I believe uh, we've all learned a lot from your talk today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, thank, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I think this is time for us to, to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mark Beeson, uh, for uh, addressing this important topic and answering 
uh, all those insightful uh, questions. And also thank you for everyone for coming to today's uh, pub public lecture. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude for Professor Mark Beeson to make yourself available for the event. Also, thank you everyone for coming to today's event. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, hand over to Tidy for some final remarks. Tidy, uh, here you go. Thanks. Oh, hi. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mianyu and Professor Beeson. Uh, I'm Tidy Xie, uh, the director of China Talk. Firstly, I want to promote our following event, the China Development Forum, which will be held early next uh, semester. The China Development Forum is the first forum in the Southern Hemisphere, completely initiated and organized by students. We are committed to pulling the forum down from the altar, but the students will participate, ask questions, and discuss the connection between China's development and our lives through interaction with representatives from all walks of life. The China Development Forum is similar to our China Talk, but it will contain three panel uh, discussions about three different topics related to China's development. An additional networking session is also included in the event. Moreover, we would like to hear advice from you guys. Any recommendations are appreciated and please send them to us via various channels which are showed like in the screen. And also here, here is a survey that I sent in the Zoom chat. On behalf of China Development Society, I appreciate Professor Beeson, Dr. Min Ran Liu, and all the attendees to come. It's our honor to have all of you here today. We could not organize this great talk uh, without the contribution and effort of, doc of Professor Beeson and Dr. Min Ran Liu and the support from our wonderful audience here today. Just before you go, uh, please, fill out, uh, please uh, fill out the survey sent in the Zoom chat. This survey asks for your advice about our China talk, which is extremely valuable for our development. Also, uh, just, one, just one more thing. Uh, can you guys please turn on your camera, please? I want to take a photo of this event.